David Schneider. I am the regional director for Convention of States. I've been at this for darn near 10 years. I can't even believe it when I look back and, at the, the time I've been able to spend on this worthy cause. Uh, no pun intended, but COS is a cause. COS, good, all right. But uh, we are the cause to save America. And that's the way I truly look at it. And that's why we work so hard in the grassroots trying to build our momentum. Um, I have worked in 13 different states, 13 different state legislators. I've been a registered lobbyist in 13 different states. You can imagine the amount of paperwork I have to do at the end of the each month working in that many states. Um, so and the, the best part about that is I get to meet people in 13 different states over the years. Uh, I've also had the pleasure and the honor to pass a legislation in six different states. So I've actually have a track record of, of getting legislation passed in different legislatures. And for those of you that don't work in the legislature, I know we do have a few legislators here. Every state's different. So every legislature is different. How they operate is different. And that's called federalism, and that's a really good thing, guys. Convention states is all about federalism. It is put into the Constitution specifically um, addressing federalism. It's the ultimate federalism. It's the board of directors meeting for the federal government. And we're going to talk about the, the process of Article 5, which talks about Convention of States, as well as the history and these efforts in, in our past. And why they haven't necessarily been successful in the past, and why we must be successful in this endeavor that uh, we're, we're in right now. So let's talk a little bit about the problem that exists in Washington, D.C. Um, I think we could all agree it is a swamp. Uh, we have a debt and spending problem, we certainly have federal overreach, and we have an issue with career politicians. Now, granted, you, not every politician that goes to Washington, D.C. seems to spend 45, 50 years there, but we do have an entrenchment problem. And it seems like everybody likes their own politician or their own congressman, but they're not so kind and very fond of anybody else's. So we do have some issues there. So. We're going to talk a little bit about the debt and spending crisis. Regardless of whoever's in office, debt and spending keeps going up. It's an upward trajectory that is um, pretty crazy to watch. I'll go over a graph here in just a second. The federal government is spending our way our children's livelihood, and more importantly, our grandchildren's future. And quite honestly, as a banker uh, by trade, which I've walked away from to do this, that's why I do what I do every single day. It's for my kids and my soon-to-be grandkids. I can't honestly look at their look into their eyes and tell them I didn't do something to stop what's going on with, within the the uh, federal spending. Amen. Medicare is set to be insolvent. Social Security as well. We're on a, a trajectory of insolvency in the. In the in the uh, federal government. So national debt, debt, who's spending it? Well, again, it doesn't matter who happens to be in the, in the uh, Oval Office. The trajectory of the spending is certainly uh, going to be off the charts. And, and this is out of date already. This was, uh, uh, it says February of 22. So that's a year old already. And you see it says 30 trillion. I think we're up over 32 trillion at this point. So you can see the trajectory is continuing in that, that upward trend. Upward trend is lightly, right? I mean, pretty crazy to look at. So you notice that there's red and blue stripes on there. Uh, I'm not going to blame everything on the person, the occupant of the Oval Office, but it certainly doesn't look like it matters who sits in that particular office. Government spending, where does it go? Of course, we have entitlements that are non-discretionary spending that takes up the most of it. We don't even talk about some of this stuff that's already on the books and we're already on the book to spend. If we were to look at the the uh, the actual stuff that we've already signed up for, the estimation is our our debt is somewhere or our deficit is somewhere in the $150 trillion mark. But you can see over every single year, we're spending just $4 trillion just on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. You know, $1.7 trillion on defense, education, and energy. And $305 billion just on interest payments. And that number has almost doubled. That particular number has almost doubled in the last year. Does anybody think the interest rates are going to go down in the inflationary rates that we're experiencing right now? No. 
that number is only going to continue to go up in the near future. Regulations without end. You know, pre-COVID, I had the same slide up, but uh, post-COVID, I think it's even more apparent that we have an uh, agency problem in Washington, D.C. With over 180,000 pages of regulation on average, Americans violate at least three punishable regulations every single day. Most of those punishments could be jail time. Not uh, <clears throat> in 2022, unelected bureaucrats are creating a new regulation at a pace of every two hours and 38 minutes. We now live under a 3,000 page constitution. Now, this version of the constitution was printed in 2010. It's 3,000 pages long. This thing has gotten bigger since then. Now, if you look at the spine of this book, it says, sorry, upside down. The Constitution of the United States of America. Now, is that bigger or smaller than the pocket Constitution that you all carry? <laughs> so, not only a regulatory problem, but we have an activist court problem because this is the redefinition of our Constitution. Now, you can see how thick it is. But it does have all seven original of the articles of this, along with the 27 amendments. Now, I don't need 3,000 pages to write that when I can get the same amount of in that particular book. But you can see that the federal government or the federal courts have reinterpreted our, our little beauty co uh, pocket constitution and expanded the powers and the jurisdiction of the federal government into a way that makes no sense to our founders and our framers and expanded the powers and jurisdiction of the federal government. Career politicians, I talked about. Again, you, you can look at both sides of the aisle on this. I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit bipartisan. You know, uh, some, some. I personally love uh, Chuck Grassley, but uh, you know he's been there for 47 years. Uh, Chuck Schumer, 41 years. McConnell, 37 years. Nancy Pelosi, 34 years. Average tenure of Congress continues to rise, and entrenched pol politicians are increasingly subject to the pressures of the bureaucracy that happens behind the scene. Everything that's said in that book. So let's look at the solution I work on every single day, which is called Convention of States. Um, it's not the solution to everything I just talked about, but it's certainly the catalyst to bring about the solutions. <clears throat> so George Mason is featured here. He's what we call the father of Article 5. He's certainly an anti-federalist. He didn't sign the Constitution because he believed that the Constitution gave the federal government, which was being created, too much power, and it did not include a Bill of Rights, so he refused to sign it. But two days before the end of the Constitutional Convention, on September 15, 1787, George Mason, an anti-federalist from Virginia, rose to point out the obvious mistake in the drafting of the Constitution. You, you, originally the plan for amendments in the prior versions had only the state convention or the convention of state method for proposing in it. But at that time, in late, with two days left in the convention, something had changed. They had only allowed Congress to be able to offer amendments. They were the only ones that had the power to propose the amendments in the draft that they were proposing or they were looking at. And he famously reminded the men that no amendment of the proper kind would ever be obtained by the people if it were to become oppressive. So I, I, I submit, given those, those issues that I pointed out right now that we're looking at, the government has become oppressive. And it'd be ludicrous to believe that anybody, that a, a government that grew to be oppressive would offer reforms on their or or uh, reforms on their oppression or their tyranny. So let's look what they actually adopted in in the Constitutional Convention. The text of Article Five and the subject of why we're talking about Convention of States is in the second clause. But let's start at the very beginning. Congress, whenever two thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution. Well, this is where we start with the Convention of States or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states shall call it a convention for proposing amendments which in either case shall be valid to the intents and purposes as part of this constitution. 
when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. Or it could be ratified by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by Congress. That's, that's, that is all Article 5 says. There are some uh, additional things that uh, no longer apply, like things they can't propose uh, before a certain date, but those dates are long gone. So this is what's currently active within Article 5. And how it actually works. So let's talk about the actual mechanisms behind calling conventions, proposing amendments, and then ultimately ratification and adopting. First, the people lead the process. We have to say, you know what, we want to gather together. We wanted to discuss the, the dysfunctional federal government, and we would like to propose reforms to it. Well, we as citizens can't just do it. Um, we need to talk to our state legislators. They have the power, as we read in Article 5, to call this convention. So the citizens ask the state legislators to, to sponsor and support the Convention of States resolution. And it is a resolution. There's no governor's signature needed on this. It's an act by the state legislature. The state legislators act. They consider the proposal. In this case, in the state of Kansas, we have two chambers, unlike our wonderful neighbors to the north in Nebraska with the unicameral. We have to pass it through our House and Senate. The state legislator sponsors the resolution, gathers the co-sponsors, runs it through a committee process, and then brings it to a floor vote. As long as we get the majority necessary in that particular state uh, to pass the resolution, that state is added to the number of states for the particular call for that particular <coughs> meeting, that call for a convention. Once you get to 34, which represents two thirds of the states, the convention is called. The states send as many delegates as they choose, but each state only gets one vote in the, at the meeting. So equal state representation. Remember, this is a convention of states. In the states created the federal government in the same manner, in the fact that uh, the state of uh, Virginia had as just as much say as the state of New York, as which had as much say as the state of Pennsylvania in the 13 original. At this particular convention, we have as much say as New York or California or Texas, and so does Wyoming, the least populous state. I was just in Wyoming earlier this week. They have 680,000 people in the entire state. I'm in a county in Central County. I think we have 680 in this particular uh, county, I believe. So you can imagine the entire state of Wyoming has as much population as the state of uh, Central County. They have equal vote at this meeting, as well as Kansas, as well as the state of California. This is not arguable. This is absolutely uh, part of the process of a convention of states. They come together as equal sovereign entities into this process. Amendments are proposed. Delegates propose, debate, and vote on amendments limited to the language of the call for that particular meeting. Now, the germaneness rule, some might talk about that. Um, there's been uh, so the app, on the applications of the several states, it, it, uh, the, the states actually write why they want to meet. What's going to be the subject matter of this particular meeting? Why are we going to come together? Why do we want to call a convention of states? And that is what the subject of the entire proceedings is about. That's the only thing that they're allowed to talk about. So if they want to come together specifically to talk about term limits, for instance, the only thing that they could talk about is how they would limit the terms of, of folks. They couldn't talk about anything else in that, and they would have um, a germaneness rule in, as, as per that. Proposed amendments passed by the majority of the state delegates are then sent to the states for ratification. There is no way of getting around ratification. Ratification is hardwired into the Constitution. You have to submit any proposal from this meeting to the, back to the states for ratification. The only thing the Convention of States talks about is the first part of Article 5, the, the, the proposing part. Only when 38 states agree to the ratification does it become part of the Constitution. Proposed amendments are only valued after ratified by 38 states. Now think about the math on that. 
There's 50 states, of course. Unless you talk to some of the uh, 51ers. <laughs> but uh, if you, if, if using that math, 13 states can block anything. Anything. So anything radical coming through this process is pretty far-fetched, the fact that the 13 states... Now, it's even more hard, it's even harder to, to ratify things than thinking about 13 out of 50. There's 99 state legis legislative bodies in America, because Nebraska, as I talked about, only has one. Otherwise, we'd have 100, two for every state. Just to get a bare minimum ratification, you'd have to have 76 out of 99 legislative bodies in America agree to any of these proposals. And to block anything means you don't even take it up. And as a, for instance, everybody, anybody know what the 21st Amendment is? Nope. Well, if you drink alcohol, I see some alcohol over here. It's the repeal of prohibition. And the state of Kansas, near and dear to my heart, uh, liked prohibition at the time. So when the 21st Amendment was proposed to the state of Kansas, guess what Kansas did? Nothing. They ignored it. They hoped that it would go away, but enough states actually ratified it, so it became part of the Constitution. Uh, repeal prohibition. But again, to block it, you just do nothing. You sit on it. So that's the easiest thing to do in the political world. Only when the ratification happens does it become part of our Constitution and becomes the law of the land. So let's talk a little bit more about the history of, of uh, Article 5 and this process. Because most people think it's a new thing. And that's the funniest thing, right? And you start looking at this and like, wow, there's nothing new under the sun here. Well, we've amended the Constitution 27 times. But we had to use Article 5 every single time to get 27 amendments. Think of Article 5 as an action plan. It's a constitutional game plan written right into the Constitution. It's very plain language. It's a very small you know, paragraph that talks about this. But all the steps have to be accomplished to actually ratify, and it's been done only 27 times without skipping any step in the process. 16 of those 27 amendments can directly tie their, their genesis or their beginning to an Article 5 Convention of States effort that started in the states in some way. The proposing step, right? Even the Bill of Rights, you could look at those and look at Virginia making the very first application for the Convention of States, even before the first Congress met to call a convention of states to propose the Bill of Rights. That happened a month or two before Congress even got to Washington, D.C. to start considering things. But the states, or the proposing step cannot be bypassed. It's two-pronged, right? Either Congress can propose with two-thirds of the bulk chambers, or states can propose with two-thirds once they agree to meet on a particular subject. <laughs> and then there's the ratification step. Three-fourths of all the states must approve. That's 38 states out of 50. Must approve before anything happens. Well, states have pushed for reform in, in, in many times in, our, in U.S. history. And you can think about all the different efforts that have happened. Um, states have never reached two-thirds agreements on white and meat for a convention. So yet we've never actually had an Article 5 convention states. 34 states have to agree on why to me. Uh, Congress can propose, obviously with two-thirds, I've already talked about that, but there's been many efforts uh, to push for a convention of states. And, you know, aggregation is what it's called. You have to have 34 states aggregate together to uh, uh, get the call to happen. Uh, states have called for conventions to deal with all kinds of things. The first application I mentioned was for Virginia, followed closely by New York, both pushing for the Bill of Rights. And it did one thing. It got Congress in gear and actually uh, mass gathered all the ideas that were floating around for the Bill of Rights and he cobbled them together and actually passed out of Congress 12 ideas that he pushed out to the states for ratification. Ultimately, the first 10 became our Bill of Rights. And then the 27th, long after the first 10, um, was part of that as well. All really good amendments, and I think everybody would agree to those. But there's been other efforts by the states to call a convention, specifically to deal with the times, right? So the Bill of Rights was obviously in the, in the late 1700s. You had the nullification crisis in the 1830s. Anybody ever heard of the nullification crisis? 1830s, yeah, Carl, you've heard of it. 
But uh, a lot of wonderful scholarly work happened in the 1830s. You know, there was a couple of states pushing the back against the federal government. It was creating some real loggerheads, right? Madison was still alive, which was amazing to look at his work because in 1831, 1832, <laughs> he wrote a series of letters dealing with the subject matter. And he talked specifically about state nullification. He talked about convention of states. And ultimately, his words could be summed up as, you do everything in the Constitution before you start looking outside the Constitution for remedies. If in fact you can't use, if the things that you use within the Constitution don't work, ultimately you can resort to things outside the Constitution such as resistance, including nullification, including ultimately, if that doesn't work, revolution, as they had to do against the king. So he, he was amazing insight in that in the 1830s and the fact that he had lived under the Constitution that he helped draft. He was the father of the Constitution. He had lived under it for 40 years. He had served as its president, a, a, a congressman in the first Congress. He had served as an ambassador and, of course, uh, had gone on to be a, a statesman after his service with the country. So it was just an amazing uh, uh, look into the history of the, of the process at that particular point in time. The man who helped draft Article 5 and had lived under it for 40 years was giving us the solution that sits right in front of us today. But it continued on. In the 1860s, there was an effort to eliminate slavery. There was calls from the states to get into a convention to deal specifically with slavery before the Civil War broke out. Um, unfortunately, they were not successful prior to that point. There was a last-ditch effort to call a convention of states uh, called the Washington Peace Conference. All states participated, including this wonderful state of Kansas, sent delegates to it. It's the last time all the states met in a convention setting. Now, it wasn't called under Article 5 because they waited too long, and it's hard to actually make these calls under Article 5 because you have to have all these states agree in a formalized way. But they did meet. They did discuss things, and they did propose an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Unfortunately, because they did not use Article 5 and they waited too long, they had no power to make that proposal, so they had to give it to Congress. <coughs> Guess what Congress did with it? Nothing. War broke out about a month later. So the proposal was it would have uh, solved the slavery issue into the new territories, and the southern states all participated in this, and they had agreed to it. So again, it would have saved off, probably would have saved about a million lives in American history. Uh, other efforts in, our, in U.S. history uh, continued on. We talk about the direct election of U.S. Senators. Of course, the 17th Amendment, um, we talked about Roger Marshall coming here next week. He's elected by us. Um, 100 years ago, that was not the case. We had uh, state senators, the state legislators that uh, selected those individuals. And uh, there was a big uprising in America to call a convention of states uh, dealing with that and their representation in Congress specifically. Early 1900s, there was a huge effort to define marriage. Boy, that's something new, isn't it? But uh, polygamy, of course, was, I guess was a thing back then, and uh, several states were jumping on board with trying to define marriage and keep it to one man and one woman. Imagine if, in fact, we would have actually got that hammered out 120 years ago. <laughs> uh, there was several efforts to eliminate the income tax, never an effort by the states to impose one, but certainly to eliminate one. I would certainly love that. Uh, there was a big effort to address the Supreme Court's power, especially after the New Deal, and the decisions that expanded this book quite extensively. And talking about the Commerce Clause, there's probably about half of this that deal with just the Commerce Clause. And then, of course, I talked about the anti-prohibition, the uh, repeal of prohibition. That started with the Convention of States. There was a rapid succession of states calling for an Article 5 convention to uh, do away with the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition. And it got, it, it got Congress in gear to propose that one. There's been several efforts to limit federal powers by uh, the Convention of States efforts in the past. And lo and behold, term limits on Congress. There's, there's been efforts to do that as well. All in all, there's been roughly about uh, 400 plus applications for a convention. And again, we've never had two-thirds agree on why to mean. Um, a lot of good things have always happened by these efforts, and it's always caused Congress to do something, right? When they sit on their hands and refuse to address the issues of the day, these efforts have always pushed Congress in the right direction. 
Abraham Lincoln, obviously I talked about slavery and I talked about uh, the, the conventions that were the calls for conventions, mostly northern states at that point, Ohio, Indiana, he kind of kicked off those, those efforts. Um, Abraham Lincoln about, talked about it in his, his initial inaugural speech, his first inaugural speech in 1861. While I make no recommendation of amendments, I fully recognize the rightful authority of the people over the whole subject to be exercised in either of the modes prescribed in the instrument itself, and I should, under existing circumstances, favor rather than oppose a fair opportunity being afforded to the people to act upon it. I will venture to add that to me, the convention mode proceeds preferable in that it allows amendments to originate with the people themselves instead of only permitting them to take on or reject proposals <coughs> originated by others not especially chosen for that particular purpose and which might not be precisely such as they would have wished to either accept or to refuse. Dwight David Eisenhower. I actually have the audio, so I don't think it'll come through here. We got this speech recorded. Um, he went to the commencement speech, did a commencement speech at Defiance College. He actually did it twice, once while president, once after he was president. This was 1963. He gave the, the speech at, uh, <clears throat> he was actually personal friends with the president uh, who had served on his uh, wartime staff over in Europe. And so he went there a couple different times. You know, the guy was actually a speechwriter for Eisenhower, so he might have had a hand in this particular speech as well. But through their state legislatures and without regard to the federal government, the people can adopt such amendments as will reverse any trend that they see as fatal to true representative government. Okay. And again, I have the audio, but I'll just kind of skip out of that. I love this picture because that's me. <laughs> hey, they put me in this one. So our plan is simple, is to use Article 5 for exactly the purpose that the founders envisioned, to call a convention of states to propose amendments to, the further, to further limit the power of the federal government, its limit is taxing and spending authority, and limit terms of federal officials. So we talk about three different reasons why we want to have a convention of states. One, again, is to put further limits on the federal government. Two, limit is taxing and spending authority. And three, limit terms of federal officials. So what we need to do is pass resolutions through 34 states. We talked about the first step. That's the first step. Um, we've passed right now through 19 states. I personally, as I mentioned, have helped six states, including almost everything that surrounds Kansas. Uh, Oklahoma's joined in. Missouri's joined in. Texas has joined in. Uh, Nebraska's joined in. Uh, North Dakota. Uh, several other states. Those are the ones I personally helped along with Wisconsin. Our resolution, section one, the legislature of the state of Kansas hereby as applies to Congress under the provisions of Article Five of the Constitution of the United States for the calling of the convention of states limited to proposing amendments to the Constitution that impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limits the terms of office of, of its officials and members of Congress. It's, it's, it's been amazing. The last 10 years of my life has been absolutely crazy. Um, I, somebody meant, I think it was Vail mentioned that I used to be in the banking world. Uh, I worked right here in Wichita for a while. Um, I grew up in southern Kansas in Dark City. It's my hometown. And since becoming the state director of Convention of States, um, my first time here I was a state director. Now I'm a regional director for the organization. And I get to meet all these grassroots individuals in all these different states, and it's just been amazing. But we have volunteer leadership in all 50 states of the Union. There's not one state that we don't have an operation in. Five million plus of volunteers and supporters across America, and 1,700 district captains. We need more. Uh, there's about uh, around 6,000 districts in America, so you can see we have some openings. Uh, we certainly need more district captains. The green states in this particular uh, map are the past states. We've passed the resolution in all those green states. You can see Kansas is right there in the middle with an orange. It's not passed yet. But we do have 67% of all Kansas want to get this done. 
Uh, we've done the polling a couple different times, and it's pretty 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 steady. Um, there are some other glaring holes. Obviously, uh, Wyoming, Montana have not joined in. Uh, so I've been working really hard there the last couple of years. I just took on those states two years ago. Um, I just got back from Cheyenne this week in Montana. I was up in Helen earlier this week. Um, so we've got some work to do, but uh, we're getting close. I mean, Kansas can be state number 20. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, this is the man that got me involved in the whole movement. He wrote a book in, in 2013 called the Liberty Amendments, and if you haven't read it, that's what inspired me to do what I do. And uh, I used to listen to Mark, I still listen to Mark, but uh, I listened to him every night on my way home. And uh, it just happened to be that uh, I woke up and I was convicted that I needed to do something. And I was very certain that this was the solution I was looking for. But uh, you can see his endorsement, I won't read it, but he certainly, uh, I've been honored to meet him and hang out with him a couple times. The guy is, uh, doesn't do very many events, but he loves to do convention states events. Governor Ron DeSantis, uh, certainly one of our, our, our big sponsors and uh, champions of the, he's kind of getting some headlines as of late, uh, but uh, he's always been a big champion of ours. Uh, even when he was a member of Congress, he was an endorser of ours. So he's known about us for a long time, and he speaks about it when, when given the opportunity. Um, I've also had the personal pleasure of working alongside of uh, former Senator Rick Santorum, uh, I was just with him a couple weeks ago. Um, we're looking to have him come to Topeka on the 21st. First day of spring, we're going to be having a rally in Topeka, bringing on all of our grassroots from across the state. You guys are welcome to come. Um, we're going to be up in the House and the Senate uh, in Kansas here in, in Topeka on that day. We're going to be, uh, I'm, I'm saying that before we get through the Senate committee, I'm assuming we're going to get through Senate committee. Um, I look at the votes, it looks good. But uh, the 21st is going to be Article 5 Convention State Day there at the Capitol. So look forward to having you guys join us. We're going to have food trucks. We're going to have uh, big bricks. Uh, he's going to come in and speak, as well as some other big, big time speakers. So let's talk, we talked about why we're going to do Convention Day. So obviously, there's some people that don't think this is a really good idea. And I get it. I, I didn't think there were any conservatives that opposed this until I got involved and I got uh, kind of ambushed by one or two of them. But uh, I didn't think any good conservative could possibly be against this. But I'm, a, I'm an action plan type person. I like solutions. So this is right up my alley, and it made perfect sense to me. And it really just floored me that there were conservatives that opposed this. So I had to deep dive in there and figure out, okay, why? Well, it comes down to fear. Fear. 100% fear. Now, I, I, I counter that <coughs> with, all right, look at what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now. I'm fearful of that. That's a given. That's a certainty. I understand what's happening there. And if you do nothing, or if we continue to do the same thing, we know what the outcome is going to be. 100%. So at some point, we have to get past that fear and actually use the, the Constitution as the framers intended us to do as their action plan. Not mine, not yours, theirs. They wrote this. So if you're a constitutionalist and do not support convention states, we really need to take a hard look at why. Is it just fear? If it is, you really need to get over it really fast. So let's talk about some of the other opponents. I, love, I wish I could play this video. It's pretty good. But uh, you can see Hillary Clinton. Uh, she came out pretty hard against us. Uh, said that we're a right-wing conspiracy. And... You know, we want to get radical change in the Constitution and hardwired religious liberty and various other things. It was pretty interesting. But it's basically the same arguments I hear from some on the right, but it was she substituted the Second Amendment. Because I hear that sometimes from the, our conservative friends that said, well, if we do go through this process, we've got the Second Amendment at risk. I can tell you that's no, not the case. I, again, I can go into the math equation that if you're a rational individual, you'll understand. But um, she's basically stoking fears. And right after she did this, it was pretty interesting. Um, within six months, uh, the group called Common Cause picked it up. Um, anybody familiar with Common Cause? Have anybody seen that? A few of you. It's a Soros policy group. Uh, they went around and, and got a consortium of different Soros groups. About 230 of them signed a mutual letter against us. Now. 230 of the most leftist organizations in America signed a letter against you. You would think you're probably on the right track, right? 
So it's pretty interesting. Um, I actually fought, fought against Common Cause in Nebraska, and it was pretty cool because I was a lobbyist. Yeah, 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 I'm a lobbyist. And they had six Common Cause lobbyists lobbying against my issues, against convention states. It was, I took a picture. I couldn't believe it. There's six Soros guys on the other side of them, just me. I'm like, I'm going to beat these guys. This is awesome. And we did. I, I, we were able to beat them. So, but I, it's just funny because these guys masquerade. And it's interesting you've never heard of them because they usually take on different names in certain states. I've heard, I've seen the same group called Defend Our Constitution. Well, if you look at their Facebook page, you can pull it up right now. It's called Defend Our Constitution. If you like that page, that's common cause, guys. They're masquerading <laughs> as conservatives. You can look at the colors. The color scheme looks the same, but if you actually now, one good thing about Facebook, and I'm not going to say be anything great about this, <laughs> but they started to do a little bit of uh, transparency. So if you actually go there, it actually does say common cause on the very bottom. They have to disclose the fact that it's paid by common cause. But uh, yeah, we're talking all the most leftist organizations that joined in with them, ACLU's in there, um, La Raza, uh, Emily's List, um, MoveOn.org, they all signed this letter. It's pretty interesting. Then I go to Wyoming. Oop, next screen. Oh, it's locked up. That's great. Let's see if I can get this back. Because this picture is awesome. i got to get it. Oh, it is. It's a great thing, isn't it? Here we go. Let's just keep this. All right. Well, not exactly. Yeah, there we go. So, you guys ran across the League of Women Voters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, Pro-Abortion League of Women Voters, uh, they hate me. Uh, they <coughs> come out and apparently, their nat national organization is on that same list. So, the person on the left there is League of Women Voters. Has anybody ever heard of the John Burt Society? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a few of you. Um, they're not as prevalent in the state of Kansas, but I, I tell you, when I go into Wyoming, they're, uh, they're considered very right-wing, right? They're considered the purest of all pure conservative uh, uh, issues. Well, they hate convention states, so it's pretty interesting. I took a picture of the far left sitting next to the far right opposing the issue that I'm proposing in front of this committee. This is actually the, the, the Wyoming House Committee that I was in front of. We, we passed a resolution in this committee last week, uh, but it was I just had to take a picture of this. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, where else can you see the far left and far right agreeing on one thing? And I just did that I was on the right track because I was split in the middle on this. <coughs> so what can you do? We always ask folks to get involved. Sign the petition, and uh, conventionofstates.com is our website. You can't miss us. Uh, we've got several of our button, uh, button guys around here, uh, the white buttons. But uh, sign our petition. Uh, you can become a district captain, volunteer with us, but you don't have to. You can contribute, you can give money, you can do all that fun stuff. I have to uh, get paid and, and uh, run around the, 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 these, the, the country promoting this. Uh, I make far less money than I used to do <laughs> as a banker. I spend a hell of a lot more time on the road. But it does cost some money, so I appreciate all the, the folks that do support us. We have amazing donors across America. Estimated about 300,000 different donor, uh, donors in America. So we're making a difference. Uh, it's amazing what has happened in 10 years. Uh, 10 years, I was the only one in, in Kansas, pretty much, that they even knew what convention state was. I remember arriving at the Capitol building in 2014, early 2014, and nobody knew what it was. And honestly, I, I swear, there was one, one guy, it was Pete DeGraff. <coughs> So Pete DeGraff was my best friend that first year. Him and I uh, worked the issue, and uh, he became my, my sponsor, and it's just grown exponentially. So just to tell you a little bit about where we are in the state of Kansas, uh, again, I told you we're having a rally. We're going to have resolutions up before the House and Senate coming very soon. Uh, 
we passed the House committee. We have not yet passed the Senate committee. The Senate committee is going to be on the 13th. So we're going to have our resolution in front of there. Um, I'm bringing in <coughs> constitutional scholar uh, Michael Ferris to speak on our behalf to give the legal the side of things. Uh, he actually wrote the resolution that uh, we brought to the state legislature and answer any questions that might be out there. He's also been a personal mentor to me. So it's going to be great to have him in Kansas. I've not spent much time with him lately. Uh, he just left Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, he was their uh, president and CEO. Uh, so he's been in front of the Supreme Court, I think, 13 different times and won like nine of those 13. So he's certainly a great voice for us. Um, there's a QR code. You can sign, uh, you can scan, and, and make sure you sign the petition. But, uh, what time have we got here? Yeah. About that time? Yeah. Yeah, so it'll open up for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, as a supporter of the Convention of States, one thing I wonder about what kind of security is going to have to, because, because we, the people can go through metal detectors, but when they get when they get to the floor, I expect <coughs> fist fights. I expect I expect wrestling matches. I mean, what kind of security, how much security are you gonna have for this? That's actually a great question. I, I do anticipate this to be the biggest civics lesson that this country's gonna ever go through. I mean there we've got a whole <coughs> class of citizens that have not even gone through civics, so they're going to have to quickly learn what's in the Constitution so they can make proposals as well. But to that point, there is going to be some craziness. There's no question about it. Uh, security would be very like, very much like a, a legislative body. Um, we would probably believe, if you look at the conventions of old that have happened, they always held them at uh, state buildings that were uh, like capital buildings. You know, Nebraska is volunteering their extra chamber. They do have two chambers up there. They just use one of them. So the, um, we'd probably have it in a secure location, something like that. But again, Congress does one ministerial thing to start this whole thing, and they get to call the convention. So they'll probably choose Washington, D.C. But the states quickly meet, they uh, adjourn, or come in and, and pick their, their elected officials within their, their body. And I would absolutely hope that they would move it out of D.C. and back to Kansas or middle of the country somewhere. So, but uh, security <coughs> absolutely would be paramount to this, this uh, this this meeting for sure. Uh, other questions? You, you have mentioned term limits for uh, federal officials. Could this include federal judges? Perhaps they can be to get a lifetime appointment. You get them to be a ten-year appointment. They could be renominated again to go through their application process again. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, we leave it up to the federal officials. So <clears throat> anybody that serves in the federal that capacity, is, and, and we specifically mentioned, and members of Congress. So it's not limited to Congress. It, it certainly could look at federal officials and the fact that federal judges fall into that category. You know, everybody always says that we have lifetime appointments for our federal judges, and everybody also that's a constitutional understand the constitutionalist understands that's not that's not the case. It's good behavior, right? So we forget that sometimes, uh, but it's some kind of lost. They absolutely under practice have lifetime um, appointments. So should probably be addressed. Uh, address, maybe have an age limit, something, um, you know, term limit of some sort. I don't know what that is. What I do know is the states need to talk about it. We need to have a discussion about it because it is a back and forth yo-yo match between who's ever in the Oval Office gets to, to make these nominations. And uh, it certainly can have a very quick effect if you've got uh, some uh, Supreme Court justices that all of a sudden leave the court at, all, at, at a quick moment. You can get some real swings back and forth and it's not supposed to be like that at all. Hello, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to voice this to voice his concern. My, I, my, my father was a banker, comes out of the same industry that you do. So your two points, your two lead, leading points, debt and fiscal conservative responsibility ring home, resonate. Mm -hmm. However, when I look back at a, a recent event not long ago in Syria that brought into uh, our president's declaration, uh, 
where he described a red line in the sand. It brings to mind uh, a gambit called Let's You and Him Fight. And the question is, if, if we do propose physical constraints and limits, what then if our adversaries go to us because of the weakness of our fiscal and monetary policy? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly what that would look like, but obviously there's concern for emergency status. But I also have concern that we've basically been living under emergency status for the last 20 years. So I don't want to make it easy for them to cheat on this as well. But I do believe you could tie probably our debt to GDP or something along those lines and make it uh, at least reasonable. Right now, there is no, there's no tethering. There's no limit on how much they can coin, right? There's no limit. And I say coin, but they just invented out of thin air. They just print money. No, they don't even do that anymore. They literally just issue decimal changes, and uh, we have instant money. It's crazy. But so those are the type of fiscal responsibilities that we need, as well as probably need general accounting principles placed on the federal government. Instead of just having rainbow and unicorn uh, numbers that come out of Washington, we actually need them to be held to the same standards that you and I, if we're business owners, and if we were running our own business, you know, the type of accounting they use, if we did it, we'd be in federal, we'd be in federal pen, right? Uh, it's ridiculous. They're allowed to do things that you and I cannot do, and that's tyranny. Thank you very much for uh, being here at the Pachyderm. Um, the conservative of the conservatives uh, was a lady uh, affectionately known as Mrs. America or Phyllis Shapley, and uh, she started the uh, uh, Republican Assembly movement, and um, she was very much uh, opposed to the Convention of States. I'm wondering if you had read any of her like 12 major reasons why she's against this. And then the second question would be, I'm sure you would address in those 12, you would address the, uh, the common runaway convention concern. Then I would also like you to address the possibility of a series convention runaway. In other words, you do this and then another group, the opposing, you know, George Soros gets a group together, they have a convention of states, and, and, and how you would control, uh, you know, the prairie fire. Yeah, there's a lot of questions in that one question, but uh, let's start with Phyllis Lapley, just a wonderful American hero, um, absolutely icon of uh, conservatism in America. Uh, she uh, started the Eagle Forum, and that's what she's most known for, is her association with Eagle Forum, and her work is just amazing. Obviously a, an icon in American history, in American conservatism, um, and also a champion for the pro-life movement in America. Unfortunately, she had some bad information, and she picked some bad friends, in my opinion, and in this subject matter. She was personal friends with Chief Warren Burger, um, who was a Supreme Court Justice, who <laughs> unfortunately authored Roe v. Wade. He was one of the architects of Roe v. Wade, and very much a protectionist of his court's activism. Now, one would ask, why was she a friend, a personal friend of, of uh, Chief Warren Burger? Well, I've got some liberal leftist friends too. I mean, they're good to hang out with. They're fun. They're, I mean, well, it's good to have great conversations with them. And I don't, but I don't take personal policy uh, things from them. And in this case, she actually wrote a letter to Chief Warren Burger, and she held up that letter, the response from him to her dying day, saying, "My dear Phyllis, you don't want to do this because it could run away and do away with your beloved Constitution." <coughs> Until her death, she held that up. Uh, there's some dispute of whether he wrote that letter or not, but it doesn't matter. She believed he did. And the fact is that that's what she held up for all those years as her reason. Now, I know she had various other reasons, but it all boiled down to fear. And as I mentioned earlier, we fear this process because we don't think it through rationally. Now, I get to the point where a Soros group may and well try to use this. There is one group called the Wolf Pack that have tried. They've gotten three states on board. Okay, three states, uh, California, New York, and New Jersey. Those are the three states. They can't get any further. They've been at it just as long as we have. They're trying to uh, overturn Citizens United, which you cannot do under our application, by the way. That's why they don't support us. They, um, they're neutral, quote unquote. Uh, but I oppose them. I do not want them to be successful. And one would ask, you know, since they dive into Article 5 and try to, conventions, try to call a convention, is it the same thing? And no, it's not. It's just like voting. 
we don't condemn voting because the left vote. No, we engage in voting and we try to get more folks engaged in voting because we need the conservative things to happen. So it's just because they decide to use Article 5 doesn't mean they're going to be successful. Matter of fact, the left has given up on Article 5 for the last 75 years. They know they cannot get anything ratified. Why do you think Congress will not propose any of those type of amendments? They know they can't get anything to do with the Second Amendment through uh, 38 states. It's in, it's incredible, uh, monumental task. It's impossible. In fact, that's going to be our toughest task as well, and I recognize that point. Getting to a convention is hard enough. Ratification takes 38. It's pretty tough. James? Yeah, I might be a bit confused. I understand you're saying the states have to call for a convention of states. Correct. But didn't you say there's only one subject they can discuss at the convention? Correct. So then who picks the subject and when? That's a great question. So on the application of the several states, Congress shall call a convention of states. That's in Article 5. That's written in there. The applications. So what we're passing right now in Kansas is an application. In that application, it specifies exactly what was and will be discussed at that convention. In our, in our case, it's three subject matters within that call, okay? Fiscal restraints on the federal government, term limits on federal officials, and anything that reduces the size, scope, and jurisdiction of the federal government. That's the germaneness of that call. And that's what all these states have agreed to? Nineteen different states have to pass identical resolutions. Okay. Uh, David, you mentioned federalism, and I, I, I'm assuming that's states' rights. Yes. You know, the power of the states are... are, are or the check and balance on the federal government? That's correct. I understand in Kansas, in order to get the uh, votes necessary uh, for this convention to, to pass, that there's a have to amend the, either amend the Kansas Constitution or there's a lawsuit basically that's going to set the Kansas Constitution aside. Is this a good example of federalism? Well, I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> one thing you cannot do is limit a right that exists in the U.S. Constitution. And each of the states have a right that's, in, that's written right into the Article 5 to call or to make application for a convention of states. That is a right that's guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution, which I would argue is supreme law of the land. There is a supremacy clause that exists, and when you have a contradiction between a, a state constitution and the U.S. Constitution, we all know that the U.S. Constitution rules out on that. Now, to answer your question even more pointed, in the state of Kansas, yes, the Kansas Constitution says two-thirds of, of both chambers must agree before we, it can be added to a convention of states uh, call. So that's what we live under until somebody tells us otherwise. Um, so when we have our vote, we are subject to that very rule or that very thing in the Kansas Constitution. So uh, after that point, I can't answer anything further because that's just speculative. Okay, last question right here. During the 80s, we almost, the states, the states almost agreed on a balanced budget amendment. I yeah. recall oh, we were very close, about 30 states. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but Congress tip over eight, they don't count them. And the other, the main point of this I wrote to is why, it, I don't see that there's any need to identify issues to call the convention Right. The Congress won't count the petitions, so it needs to yeah. be gathered up together and publicly presented to Congress just to call for a convention by the required number of states. You don't need to put <coughs> any reasons or justification for it, but they've resisted this since uh, the early 19th century. When they quit counting because of petitions over the slavery, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. I believe it was, and they quit counting. And I haven't counted. Somebody did count. There's over 750 petitions for an Article 5 convention since 1800. <clears throat> anyway, I think you might have addressed this a minute ago the fact that there's Oh, well, Juan Paul is main. I, I agree with Juan Paul and just about everything except this issue. He doesn't support the Convention of the States. <coughs> but uh, his campaign for liberty is in <coughs> alerts about the legislature suing the, in the federal courts to pass 
this bill without the required two-thirds majority. Is there, can you address that? I guess that's my main question. Yeah, I think I just addressed it, but, um, you know, I can't speculate what will happen. All I do know is uh, we're subject to the two-thirds requirement at this point. Uh, Kansas does have that provision in the Kansas Constitution, and I do know that. Um, that's, that would be uh, speculative to a majority in both chambers, um, and I, I wouldn't have standing in that. So you'd have to. It's really tricky in, in federal court. Uh, we would have to. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.